Hey, Mark. Hello. Welcome, everybody. We are so glad that you're joining us this wonderful evening um, here in the Magic City and wherever you are. Uh, we are here tonight to talk about A Little Night Music, which, of course, the Minot Symphony will present this coming Saturday, March 6th, live at Anna Cole Nelson Hall. The doors will open at 7 o'clock and the concert will start at 7.30. There are a few tickets available for the live performance and unlimited number of tickets available for the live stream. So we certainly hope that you have your tickets. If not, give us a call real soon at 858-4228 and we will um, get you hooked up. So tonight we are proud to have uh, Dr. Eric Anderson as our host and he's going to be joined by Maestro Amaya as well as Ms. Hannah DePlazis, who is our featured soloist, and Matthew Benbedek. We just talked about the pronunciation of his name, and I probably butchered it. I apologize. Um, <laughs> and so, Eric, you go ahead and take it away. OK. Actually, I had no idea how to pronounce Matthew's name before he emailed me, and, <laughs> and then I just quickly redid the pronunciation I had been doing, which was Benbenek, 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 so I couldn't get it wrong, and then that was wrong, so it's Benbenek. Let's all say it together. One, two, three, Benbenek. Ben so, yes, well, welcome, Matthew. Um, so I wanted to, to make sure and get a, um, uh, I don't know what I wanted to make sure I was going to do. I think I was just killing time with that sentence. So, uh, we're, we're going to spend some time getting to know uh, Matthew and Hannah tonight, and we'll get a perspective from F, uh, Maestro Efrain Amaya as well. Um, this program has a couple of interesting um, correlations, one that could not have been planned um, until January in that uh, we have two pieces by, uh, by Mozart, um, and both written, um, or at least cataloged according to his pen, uh, in 1787. And we have a piece in the style of the high classical era. Um, it says Rococo, which comes, if you study music, Rococo comes a little bit earlier, but um, it's kind of attributed to the style of Mozart. And this is Tchaikovsky writing the cello concerto in the style of Mozart. Um, and so there's a kind of a, a correlation there and also a nice number correlation for those of you that like numbers, numbers that, that line up. Um, the two Mozart pieces were written in 1787, which is two sevens, a one, and an eight. And the Mozart or the uh, Tchaikovsky was premiered in 1877, which is also two sevens, a one, and an eight. Um, it has, you know, probably no significance whatsoever, but it's kind of interesting when that happens. Um, only interesting if somehow Matt or Hannah or Ephraim also in their birth year or a year that something happened also has a one and eight and two sevens, but I doubt I doubt that's probably going to happen for, you know, many years. Um, <clears throat> so diving in really, really quickly, um, I want to spend just a quick minute with each guest. Um, Efrain, um, what were some of the things that drew you to chose, uh, choose the, the Mozart pieces, other than, of course, the fact that they were available? <laughs> that's, been, that's been the story of this year. <laughs> what can we play that we have? <laughs> No, I think, uh, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, I, I've done both pieces before, but uh, it's been, it's been a long time since I've done the, the both Mozart's uh, and the, the musical joke one is always uh, so, so silly and, and fun, but yet, you know, in a way you do have to kind of explain it a little bit because some people might not get it right away. Unless you know we're talking about the the horns in the in the minuet, so that it's very obvious that they are really out of out of place. But uh, that really, I I kind of wanted to put those two. One that is so well known on the classic music, facing uh, the other, the joking side of Mozart, and of course in the movie Amadeus, they kind of when the extreme to make him really kind of very foolish and, and silly with his laughter and all that. And people remember watching that movie. But he did have a uh, jester side and he did have an immense uh, sense of humor. And, and he is so much present in actually both pieces, but, but in a way you have the serious Mozart, let's say, and then the, the funny. So it was a, I thought it was a nice contrast to put them together with a sense of people. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to play both, both pieces, certainly on a kind of knock music. That's one of those that, that grade school children, if you sing boom, 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 it's like the quintessential piece of all classical music. Now, there's another like 20 minutes after that, so it's not just that theme. Um, <laughs> and and it, it's lovely. I think the romance is just one of the most beautiful movements written, and the Rondo uh, finale is is such such a, such wonderful music making. That, as you said, the musical joke, a lot of the jokes are kind of like, um, the hidden gems in oh, uh, Dante's Inferno. If you lived in at, at that time, you knew who he was talking about. You knew the inside jokes. Um, right. Now it, it it takes a translator. Uh, the musical jokes that Mozart has. If you study music and you're aware of them, they're actually all throughout the score. But unless you're a musicologist, most of them are pretty unobvious. So it, you. Everyone will laugh at the end. Everyone will laugh at the French horns. It's mostly just very light, innocent music that is very fun and fun to study. So I'm, I'm looking forward to both of those. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it's fun that uh, the ones that the people might get to is, is this endlessly, when you know, phrases that he will not finish, uh, he will just keep going and you know, get you, drive you. So people might get those two as well. But definitely, as you say, you know, those are kind of the ones that people will catch on right away. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. So Matt, uh, we get to uh, again. Sorry, Matt or Matthew? How should everyone address you today? Uh, Matt is good. Matt. Okay, great. Yeah. And you are not a musician by profession, are you? No, no, I'm a what, 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 an engineer. Okay, and, and yeah. what do you do do by day? Uh, so I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer who I deal with uh, like oil field wellhead component stuff. So I, I'll, I'll like respond to rig downs and design new equipment for them. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. So yeah, a lot a of tricky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, w tell us how um, obviously a lot of, you know, just, you know, a good percentage of, of students in America study music. Um, most of them go into other things. Obviously, you went into something else professionally, but tell us a kind of a brief bio of, of how, uh, how your musical path was traversed. Okay. Uh, I grew up uh, in a pretty musical family, um, and I started playing the violin at about five or six. I played that all through high school. Uh, you know, joined youth symphonies uh, over in Minneapolis. That's where I grew up. Um, and then in college, like I, like I said, I studied engineering, but I, I took uh, quite a few composition classes, orchestration classes on the side. Um, and then when I moved to Minot about a year ago, I think March 1st, actually, last year. <laughs> what uh, a time to move. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I joined the Civic Symphony. Uh, I mean, the Minot, Minot Symphony. And, uh, you know, that got canceled last year. I, like the, I got one rehearsal in, I think, before the season shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. But <laughs> uh, then, you know, I started up this year and I uh, started taking lessons with uh, Maestro Hamaya uh, a few months ago. Uh, really, it's really been helpful. And then so I, I wrote this piece uh, studying under him um, in about December. OK, very cool. So this piece was written in Minot. I was wondering when when it said it was going to be a world premiere, um, whether you had packed this around for a while and just hadn't found a wind quintet. Um, oh, but yeah, so, did, did you yeah. did you write it with the Sub Zero Winds in mind? Um, I I'd hoped that they would play it, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, more it was more to to kind of learn how to write for winds was was the main driver behind it. Right. Yeah. Well, excellent. We'll we'll come back to to um, you and your pieces again. But before we move on to Hannah, I'm going to share my screen and just play a little bit of the the very end of these five maneuvers. And I want to ask you later on, like where that title came from. Um, it's certainly interesting. But but this is the last minute of um, the five maneuvers for wind quintet. Thank you. 
Excellent. Look forward to talking to you more about that in a second. So, Hannah, I wanted to go to you third because this is somewhat what it feels like to be a soloist. <laughs> you practice and you practice for years and you warm up and you, you do everything like that. And then it's time to play your piece and you just sit there and wait and sit there and wait and sit there and wait. And then all of a sudden people applaud and then you're supposed to play your best. And that's that's a, that can be a really frightening scenario. So could you talk to us a little bit about um, just what it was like to rehearse with the symphony um, last week? That was our first rehearsal. And if you can recall your experience 2014 when you were sitting in the exact same place as a freshman in high school, uh, soloing also with the Minot Symphony, what, how have you changed in terms of your relationship to the orchestra and how do you approach that moment when all of a sudden, it's all you. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, last Thursday, I was I was just really excited to do it with the symphony because I've worked on this piece for a little over a year now, but I had only ever played it with you, um, doing a few things on the accompaniment, what you could do on your cello or with piano, and it's just such a different sound with a full orchestra of, you know, 20 to 30 people, it just creates a whole new effect. And something you can't really replicate. And so I was really excited to do that. And I thought, you know, everything went really smoothly. I had a chance to go over a few spots with Efrain before the rehearsal, so he kind of knew what to expect and um, was able to lead the orchestra through different parts. And... Yeah, the anticipation you're talking about is is really hard to deal with because there's a few minutes backstage, like you said, you just have to sit and wait, and you're feeling this anxiety and nervousness, but you can't really do anything about it. You just have to learn to let it be there. Um, and I remember in 2014. I played Torrey's Elegy uh, as a freshman in high school. And yeah, the few minutes before walking on stage, and then the few seconds of just sitting before the piece started were so nerve wracking. Because you're thinking, oh my goodness, you've practiced all of this, spent so much time doing it, and now is the time everybody's watching you to do it. It's really, it's, it gives you a rush, a definite <laughs> adrenaline rush, that's for sure. Now you've had a lot of experience playing chamber music, that is string quartets, piano trios, things like that. Um, what aspect of chamber music do you to the stage in your communication with the orchestra and the, the director? Well, I think one thing that's different and the 2014 performance I had in this one is I'm a much more mature player now, much more confident in what I can do, and that allows me to communicate more freely. Um, during our rehearsal on Thursday, I didn't feel like scared to look around or to look at Efrain throughout the rehearsal and you know be able to move more, um, cueing different things, you know, being able to just just more body language. And with chamber music, I feel very comfortable 
with body language, you know, cueing different members in or just communicating phrases to them. Um, it, it, is, it is harder with an orchestra um, because there's people I can't turn 180 degrees and nod to them when we have a part together, for example, the, the clarinet later on. Um, but I can do different things to show connection with the players. Mm -hmm. That's great. Would you play just a little bit of the theme for us? Sure. Like maybe just the, the A section? Perfect. To, to talking more about this with you in just a second. So Matt, going back to your piece, um, so you said that you, you studied with Efrain. I, I'd be interested in, in hearing both of you comment a little bit on how that process went, where the piece started from, and how it reached its final form. Well, so a big uh, influence to this piece was uh, a piece by Ligeti early in his uh, career called Six Bagatelles for Wind Quintet. Because um, we, we knew I wanted to, to write for Wind Quintet because I was kind of unfamiliar with those instruments. Um, and it, it was good to have a, a kind of a base framework for the, at least the structure of the piece. So that, that piece is a lot of really short movements with the differing characters in between each movement. Um, so that, that was where it kind of started. And then he just said, go write something basically. <laughs> well, uh, we, well, we gotta go back a little. Uh, he actually, uh, he feel first. Uh, um, I came, I came, came out actually very well too, and and we actually shared it with the Sub Zero uh, kids as well. And uh, and they were, you know, I, I basically asking them if they were willing to just read it uh, at least for him to so get a sense, so he will hear it. And and they were very open about it. But it, it, that didn't happen yet. <laughs> they haven't actually read it. But after that, you know, the next step was to get him, all right, now you're ready, let's let's do a quintet now. Let's get you writing it for for the, the five instrument. Getting that such a it's a, such a typical ensemble. It, it, this, I actually have all my students usually go through that route, you know, writing for the different families of the orchestra. And if you go through the wings, you'll have to end up writing a woodwind quintet. The same with the brass and, and so on, you know, brass quintet, string quartets, and so on. So yeah, that was that was the the path, so to speak. It's yeah. just you know learning process. And and again, you know, the the bagatelles is a is a good piece for them to because uh, thinking about form and all that stuff. So people don't worry too much about okay, what form am I going to use? So if you keep it smaller, uh, it's it's always easier to handle forms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, a, a model is a really good thing to have, both as a mentor and as someone that's, you know, a, a piece of music that you can can look after um, for for inspiration. Um, certainly, you know, like Matt Matt's piece is five movements in about nine minutes, um, so a little less than two minutes per movement. You compare that to the Mozart, which is um, probably four four movements in twenty minutes, something like that. The mm -hmm. So much, much longer forms. So bagatelles, uh, composers have often delighted in short forms. It's, it's kind of like short stories that compared to novels where you can just take one little idea and explore it for a while and then move on to something else. So you title these maneuvers um, and that's, that's really interesting. I had to look that up to see like what, what other, uh, so the Webster on this is a movement or series of movements, here meaning motions, not movements, but right. a movement or series of movements requiring skill and care. So skill and care seem to come up. But yeah, t talk about the, the titling and how each one of these represents a maneuver. Yeah, so uh, it was kind of a play on words a little bit, right? Um, movement and, and movement. Um, and also each, each uh, maneuver is kind of a different, uh, different character and, and the idea behind it 
is like is like each so the each title of them is a different like motion like the bustle soar stumble plunge and shimmer Skill and care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have and, you uh, worked with Have you worked with the winds wind quintet yeah. while they prepared this? Yeah, I've, I've had a few rehearsals with the Sub Zero, and they're doing a good job so far. So I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really, really great to hear it performed live, and much better than the MIDI uh, recording, right? And uh, right. And I, I, sh I should let everyone know what you heard was the MIDI recording, which is basically the notation program he used is representing the sounds digitally. So that's why it sounds almost like lifeless. So yeah. that was not real people. <laughs> that was a <laughs> digital representation of his piece. Yeah, it should sound much better on Sunday or Saturday. <laughs> much more yeah. lifelike. It's, it's the bane of composers everywhere <laughs> having to, you know, when they finally hear it, oh my God, it finally sounds like a French horn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Violins with vibrato is is one of the things that Finale just cannot do well or Sibelius. <laughs> <laughs> Awful. Um, what what are some of your favorite aspects of this piece, the five maneuvers? Like what what as a composer, like what are some of the things that make you smile, Matt? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I just love getting to explore. You know, so many different. Um, kind of kind of themes and, and colors in there without having to connect them so you're right that's why i love the the short movements like that um but uh really just kind of playing with the different instruments and their ranges and how they pair up because that's that's the, one of the interesting things about the wind quintet is all the all the instruments have a much different sound and it's a lot less homogenous than like a like a string quartet um so you can really play around with those and like you know the clarinet and the low range is a lot different from clarinet up high, um, so so just mixing it, mixing the pairs up, and uh, you know who's playing with who. Uh, that's a lot of fun in here, and I, I try to do that. Each different movement usually has uh, some different voices that are that are at the forefront. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So Hannah, going back going back to you, we've got about another five minutes, and then then I'd open it up for any questions, and we'll try and wrap it up. Um, so Tchaikovsky did not write many sets of variations. Could you could you talk a little bit about the piece itself and what is what do we mean by variations? And then if if there's if or if you prefer, maybe talk about the controversy behind the order of the variations. Yeah, I could talk about both of those. Sure. So the theme and variations is a common musical form or structure usually seen a lot in classical music and it consists of the theme or a main melody that is then changed or evolved for each variation um, changes can be with rhythm harmony uh, orchestration or a combination of of each of them or uh, whatever the composer puts together. Mm -hmm. So Tchaikovsky originally wrote the theme with eight variations and a coda. Um, he worked with a German cellist named uh, Wilhelm Fitzenhagen, who he perf he performed it in the original form. Um, let me double check. 1877. In 1877. Um, but later on, he changed the order and completely cut out at least one variation without Tchaikovsky's permission. So he switched the order around, cut one out, spliced some here and there, thinking it would make it more exciting. Um, and ironically enough, it's the, the most popular version of it used mm -hmm. and taught today you you rarely hear the original writing 
Um, so yeah, this this version is known as the the Fitz and Hagen edition, basically. Mm -hmm. And and that's the one that everyone learns. Almost yes. only like some specialist who's well advanced into their career might look back and say, "I'm going to try and do a recreation." Mm -hmm. um, so, so we've got these, these sets of variations, and it's kind of like Matt's piece in that they're all little vignettes, little stories. Um, could you just give us a, a little insipit of each one? Yes. So the theme is actually just about 40 measures long. Um, but this main part, that's just the first two measures. <laughs> It can be easily heard in each of the variations. Uh, for example, variation one is... And relating back to the theme, it would sound like this. So we've got a um, little bit of note changing, and it's played in triplets, making it sound a little fancier. Uh, the, the second variation is just faster. Followed by some scales and things. Uh, the third variation is in a new key. Um, instead of A major, it's now in C major. Slow down a little bit and often related to a waltz. So if we play this with the same rhythm, same thing, just um, articulation and rhythm has changed. Uh, we go on to variation four which is decorated with some ornaments of the left hand. Um, the fifth variation, the cello actually doesn't have the melody. It's in the flute, and it's very similar to the theme. And the cello, I just accompany them with a bunch of trills. It sounds really funny. So I'll just play a little snippet. <laughs> Eric and I always say it's a little obnoxious. <laughs> um, and then after that, there's a bit of a cadenza, um, which leads it into variation six, which is in minor and quite a bit slower. And then last is Variation 7, also titled Coda. Um, it's, you can, you can definitely hear this, the theme very clearly, except notes are repeated and it's much faster, so you get this exciting hoorah of an ending. And then it, it continues on. Okay, just play the very last arpeggio of the piece after the the big chord. Sure. <laughs> Have to keep you on your toes as your teacher. You didn't know I was going to ask you to do that. <laughs> but um, this this piece uses the entire cello. It goes actually even a fifth higher than that note. The the high A. Go ahead and play the high A again. Mm -hmm. But it does and go it to right. <laughs> so that note is actually used at the end of the third variation. It's Mm -hmm. um, this is it's an amazingly brilliant set of variations, and, and like Matt's piece, each variation should be considered a little a little caricature, um, a little a little fun bite that's that's different than the others. Um, it's a delightful program. Uh, Mozart's 
and, and I think what Tchaikovsky is hearkening to is elegance, refinement, um, uh, beauty of form, and beauty of surface. And I think there's a lot to enjoy in this program. Um, any last comments, Efrain or Matt, on, on this world premiere that we're, we're going to hear? I, I just think it's, you know, as, as you know, I, I find it very important that we keep uh, composers <laughs> and give them hope when they write music so that that's actually we're, we're playing living composers all, uh, as well, not only the typical classical stuff, but we, we want to, I, 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 something that I, I believe that we have to do as, as a, any, any uh, performing ensemble should do is encourage young composers to keep writing for our media, for our, our instruments. So yeah, no, definitely. Matt, any yeah. thoughts? Just excited to have people hear it. Yep, I, I'm excited to hear it too. And instead of a recording like the, uh, the zoo piece that we heard last time, which was wonderful, um, I loved it. I never, I didn't know that at all. Um, but we get to hear them live this time, right? Yep. Excellent. Um, any anything else to say, Hannah? That's that you'd like to share? No, I I think I covered everything. Okay, okay. I'm I'm really excited. Of course, proud as your teacher, um, and and friend, and and I'm just I'm I'm really excited that you get this opportunity, and it's it's super fun. It's it's so unusual to play chamber music, to play other stuff, and then all of a sudden be in the situation of being out on stage with 30 of your best friends <laughs> making music. Um, before we wrap up, do, does any anyone who's watching, do you have any questions you'd like to ask uh, any, any of our guests? If not, then Ellen, do you have any wrap up thoughts? Um, no, I sure don't. Um, thank you, Eric, very much for conducting this session tonight, um, giving us a, a deeper inside look into the program for Saturday evening. And thank you, Hannah, Matt, and Efrain for adding to the conversation. And when we hear these, these, these talks that we have about the performance, it really opens your eyes and you really get a whole different experience when you listen to the concert. So we, of course, are one of very few orchestras who are doing any type of live performances right now. And so thank you to everybody who has been so supportive, wearing masks, people are getting vaccines, people have quarantined when they needed to. And that has allowed us to be able to continue to make music on stage offering both the live performance as well as the uh, virtual. So if you are not quite ready to join us in the hall yet, uh, the live stream tickets are available at MyNotSymphony.com. You can also get tickets for the in-person performance there. Um, we're, we're getting down to a very limited number of tickets available, but there are some, there are a few available. So go ahead and give us a call. Um, and I just got one question here on the Facebook uh, feed for Hannah. It's from um, Charlie Young. It says, what is it like preparing a piece with a piano collaborator and then transforming that piece into a performance with a full orchestra? Yeah, it's really interesting because as I mentioned before, you get a whole different sound. And there is a bit of, of a communication barrier um, going from just communicating with one person to now communicating to 20 or 30 through a frame. And that can be difficult because I can show a frame something and then he needs to connect that to the orchestra and there's always bit of a reaction time um, and maybe sometimes I don't show things very well and but I think I mean so far it's been really enjoyable besides the dis difficulties it's yeah I think we're, we're doing a good job excellent and and you and she... mm -hmm. go ahead Eric no yeah yeah like like you said earlier you and Charlie actually 
do share the sixth variation. It's it's uh, I wouldn't say a duet, but Charlie plays definitely the next most important role uh, beside the the lead cello voice. It's really a beautiful obligato line, but you absolutely are 180 degrees from him and you would have to literally like turn around if you wanted to make eye contact. So it's, it's one of those things about chamber music that you usually are used to do. And with a pianist, you absolutely would be able to look right at them and say, let's play this together. Well, you and Charlie, and he can see you, but there's no way you can, he can, you can see him. Yeah, there's a definite, there's, it's such a beautiful conversation. And a few other spots happen between me and the flute um, or the French horn. And I can I can turn and see the French horns a little better, but the flute is pretty difficult to see. So yeah, I'll do what I can. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, and the question, Charlie. Absolutely. Um, hopefully, this is the. Well, not your first performance with symphony, but you are definitely second and probably the biggest at your point in this career. And we certainly are honored to provide that opportunity for you, Hannah. And we certainly look forward to many returns to Anna Cole Nelson Hall as you continue your musical career into the future. So again, just thank you for joining us tonight. There are a limited number of tickets available. Masks are required on the campus of Minot State University for the protection of everyone. So um, during the performance, we do ask that you please keep your mask on. The musicians will have their masks on. They can do it, we can all do it too. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you either online, virtually for the live stream, which will take place as we are performing. So you, if you have a live stream ticket, it will be live at 7.30 on Saturday night, one and done. So it's just like as if you were coming to the hall, only you get to stay in your pajamas if you want to and enjoy your favorite refreshment as we uh, will be here in person. So thanks again for joining us tonight and Eric, uh, Matthew, Efrain, and Hannah, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules and preparing this for us tonight. Thank you, and we'll see you at the symphony. Bye. Bye. Bye.